as the issue of climate change becomes more and more important, many countries are shifting from traditional energy sources to renewable ones. In line with this global effort, South Korea held the World Climate Industry Expo in Busan last week, showcasing climate technologies from both home and abroad. On today's Issues and Insiders, we take a closer look at what is needed to achieve net zero goals. Hello and welcome to yet another edition of Issues and Insiders. It's Tuesday, September 10th here in South Korea. I'm Baeunji. Today, we delve into what's needed to address climate change, particularly from the industrial sector. For more on this, I have Kim Hyun or Jenny Kim, former ambassador and deputy minister for climate change from South Korea's foreign ministry. Ambassador Kim, welcome. Thank you. I'm very pleased to be here this afternoon. And I also have Jens Orfelt, the regional president for RWE Offshore Wind for the Asia Pacific region. Mr. Orfelt, it's great to have you here. Thank you very much. Um, so, Ambassador Kim, let's begin with the importance of industrial decarbonization. Why does this matter so much? That's a very important question. Actually, industrial sector, they are emitting a lot of greenhouse gases. Uh, experts say that one third of the global greenhouse, uh, uh, greenhouse gases are coming from uh, the industrial sector. Uh, these days, many people are paying attention on power sector and transportation sector. However, we pay less attention to the industrial sector. In order to achieve net zero by 2050, industry sector, they must work and they must be a critical part of the climate action. That's why the greenhouse gas emission reduction in the industrial sector is important. We have to pay attention significantly. Right, efforts from the industrial sector is very important indeed. And Mr. Orfeld, as a regional president in offshore wind development, could you briefly tell us what offshore wind energy is for our viewers that may not be quite familiar with this term? And what are some benefits of offshore wind energy compared to other renewable energy sources? Absolutely. So I represent a company called RWE. Uh, we are a uh, German utility, much like the Korean Jenkos. Uh, we have a tenure of 125 years, providing growth and prosperity, first to the German people and since Northern Europe, and have expanded throughout the world. And for the past 25 years, we've been engaged in uh, renewable deployment um, amongst that uh, offshore wind, which is basically, in its essence, uh, onshore turbines that you put out in the ocean uh, where the wind speeds are greater and where you are away from visual amenity. And one of the major benefits is that you can deploy larger machines and you can do it closer to peak demand centers like Seoul or Busan, for instance, to ensure clean, sustainable energy. I see. Just out of curiosity, how long would it take to build a wind offshore wind energy farm? It depends a little bit on the permitting process. Um, we typically say it says anywhere between six and 12 years to develop an offshore wind farm project from you get the first idea to you have the final turbine commissioned. The actual construction process is depending on the size of the wind farm project, one to two years. So it doesn't take long to build it, but it takes longer to have the processes. It takes longer to have the processes, especially in new markets like Korea, where um, different government agencies from environmental uh, agencies to the uh, economic uh, agencies and so on and so forth all need to come together to issue the relevant permits because obviously this is critical infrastructure. It often involves uh, maritime habitats and birds and local fisheries, etc. So you want to make sure that everybody is on board with the, program, uh, with the project before you actually commence and press the button. Right, a lot of things to consider indeed. And Ambassador Kim, what are some challenges facing industrial decarbonization? Actually, there are many challenges in industrial sector decarbonization, uh, particularly uh, the steel, chemicals, and cement. They are emitting a lot of greenhouse gases. And all those products are so-called infrastructure products, and they are something very, very important and necessary to build, uh, to, to construct uh, the buildings and to people's daily life. Therefore, it is very hard to make something alternative for those products. 
Um, in order to reduce the greenhouse gas emission, the industry sector, they must, they must pay more cost. Therefore, the cost increase is uh, one of the biggest challenges uh, to the companies. And secondly, in order to make a decarbonization, they must invest huge, uh, and also they must develop new technologies. And huge investment and technology development cannot be done by just one or a couple of companies' efforts. So they need indeed support from the government and from the financial institutions. Uh, and thirdly, uh, many industry sector, uh, they uh, are strongly linked to the job creation. If you, you can imagine very easily that uh, steel companies, chemical companies, they create a lot of jobs. But transition to clean business means there must be a transition in jobs as well, which is a social issue. Um, therefore, if I just prioritize uh, three big challenges, cost, and huge investment uh, need, and also the social issues, these three are the biggest challenges. Right, a lot of challenges to overcome there. And Mr. Orfell, building wind turbines in the ocean, like you explained, doesn't sound too easy. What are some of the regulatory barriers and other obstacles that your company or the industry has recently faced? It's, it's not easy at all. Um, uh, it's all, again, depending on the size of the project, we're talking investments somewhere between uh, three to six billion euros uh, for each single project, but that can then deliver energy of up to uh, one million households. Um, uh, what's particularly important is that with anything, any large infrastructure, obviously you want to have very good planning, you want to make sure that you have high quality, and you want to make sure that you have um, all your uh, permits and everything in order so that uh, the project has a way forward, both financially but also safely and to be able to be deployed on time and on budget. And governments in that regard are a very, very uh, important stakeholder because essentially what we do is that we act as a vehicle for governments to realize their net zero targets. And therefore it has to be a partnership because there will always be unexpected challenges during any project of such a nature that takes, uh, that has a lifetime of up to 40 years and where the construction cycles and the development cycles are as long as they are. Right. And um, what should be done to overcome these challenges and maintain momentum? Well, I think first of all, offshore is just one of the solutions we need to consider at the same time, and this poses a uh, great opportunity also for Korean entities and Korean conglomerates who may be thinking, how can we take part in the energy transition? Because it's not just offshore wind, it's also onshore, it's also solar, it's also hydrogen, it's also EVs, uh, so on and so forth. And I think first and foremost, what government can do is that they can set very, very clear targets saying, we want these commodities, in my case offshore, to form part of our uh, plan to reach net zero by 2050. And we want to support those targets by annual auctions that are issued that gives developers and investors and financiers and supply chain reliance that this is a market that you can invest in. Because even though the capex and the numbers involved in one project is are staggeringly big, it's usually not enough for to have only one project. So if you're a turbine manufacturer, if you deliver cables, if you're a developer like me, you want to see a pipeline that you can buy into so that it's, it's, it's a longer stretch, really, because it, it does really require uh, all elements of society to come together to deliver these solutions across the spectrum of energy. Right, and um, Ambassador Kim, like you mentioned, the South Korean government aims to bring industrial emissions to near net zero by 2050, but I'm sure it's not something that can be done by the government alone, right? Because as you mentioned, a lot of cooperation is needed there. Yes, uh, first of all, Korean government announced the 2050 net zero target, and also they set 40% greenhouse gas emission reduction by the year of 2030. Actually, 40% reduction, that's a very, very ambitious target because Korea has very, Korea has a lot of heavy industries and manufacturing sector is huge. Therefore, it means actually Korean economy has a structure of very challenging uh, to reduce greenhouse gases. Um, but 
the effective implementation of Korea's NDC 40% reduction of uh, GHG by the year of 2030 and also the 2050 net zero goal cannot be achieved by exclusive efforts of the government. Actually, climate action needs um, whole of the society approach is so everybody in the society must play a role. So government uh, must set a target and government must introduce uh, uh, relevant regulations and incentives schemes. But at the same time, the companies, business sector, they must do uh, from their part, uh, they have to set their own target, they have to develop their strategy of decarbonization and also they have to change their business uh, business trajectory in line with the net zero uh, ambition. Uh, civil societies, I think they can play a huge role because they can shout to the government, to the business uh, to accelerate their efforts. And also uh, um, uh, experts, uh, technology developers, so university uh, scholars, all of them, they have quite critical role to play to support and accelerate the decarbonization efforts. And these days, particularly young people, they are, pre they are quite active, yes, they, they, because they are the ones who will live with the consequences of climate change. So it's their very, very urgent agenda. Uh, more and more young people, they raise their voice and then they ask governments, other stakeholders to stronger action uh, effectively addressing climate change. So um, not only government, but everybody in the society, they must uh, do a part and all those efforts will collect together and then can produce a good result. Right, a lot of effort is needed. And Mr. Orfeld, um, could you share your insights on the current landscape and the future outlook of the offshore wind industry in the Asia, Asia Pacific region in countries like China, Taiwan, or Japan? Yes, absolutely. I, th I think in general, uh, what we're seeing is that on the political stage, uh, globally, there's a lot of competing agendas at the moment uh, that uh, places sort of at jeopardy of maybe losing focus a little bit. Um, and it feels like with the introduction of increased geopolitical tension around the world, uh, with um, inflation rising, uh, with cost of capital going up, etc. Um, I think it's only uh, human nature that it's, it's somewhat tempting to look at current revenue streams and look at how you can lifetime expand uh, current revenue streams rather than investing in the future. And I think not just for offshore, but also some of all the other commodities I mentioned before, I think what we need to as a collective, as an industry, together with government, together with societies, is to uh, establish a framework whereby investment in green growth and investment in the future is investment in future profits. Uh, because at the end of the day, we all have shareholders, we all have voters, we all have stakeholders that we need to answer to. Uh, and if we can jointly, uh, through industry efforts and uh, led by government vision, uh, establish such um, conditions, then I think we've come a long way. And that also, to your question, um, I think it amplifies the need for government action in the Asia Pacific region at the moment, because what we've seen uh, in particularly since the um, uh, unlawful insertion by Russia in Ukraine is that it feels like the limelight and the focus, the attention of the international development community for natural reasons are shifting back to the more core markets in the sense that these are markets where offshore wind have been deployed for many, many years. Uh, government agencies have already formulated uniform uh, consensus on one-stop shop. It's easier with the permitting. Auctions are coming in a steady flow. And what we've also seen is that Europe had a very rude awakening from one day to the other. They had to shut off the gas from Russia, which meant that the energy transition was not no longer only a matter of transitioning to green energy, but it also very much became an energy security issue. And as we see LNG streams potentially divesting or diverging from uh, the Middle East to Asia, uh, I would argue that energy security is just a, as high on the agenda in APEC as anywhere else. So anything governments can do to say we're serious about the energy transition and we want to 
amplify our own efforts by making it as attractive as possible for foreign and domestic entities to invest in the energy transition, that I think will be a big uh, enabler. Right, and speaking of the Indo-Pacific region, is South Korea considered a promising market for companies that have ambitious decarbonization goals like RWE? Absolutely. Um, we've taken a very selective approach to our markets. We've selected um, South Korea, Japan and Australia. We have uh, won in an auction in Japan just last year. We've won in an auction in Australia just this year. Uh, and we have projects that are far in the permitting stages here in Korea. And the reason why we've chosen specifically Korea is that it's a highly densely populated area. We see energy demands going up. The more we use our iPhones, the more we introduce AI technologies, the more we're going to consume energy. We want that to be green energy. At the same time, Korea is a beautiful but highly mountainous uh, place that makes it difficult to deploy other forms of uh, scalable renewables. So uh, land is quite scarce and expensive and grit is difficult to roll out in the mountains. And at the same time, Korea has an abundance of shoreline and sea uh, with relatively good wind speeds. And that, the proximity to the peak demand centers, the desire to actually have an energy transition and wanting renewables as part of the energy mix, as a substantial part of the energy mix, alongside with the fact that Korea has uh, probably one of the best histories of uh, manufacturing, exporting capabilities, whether it's shipbuilding, whether it's automotive, whether it's technic, uh, we see a lot of great potential for Korea to take offshore beyond the borders of Korea and really create a new uh, export market that can support the global demand. Right, like you said, we have scarce land, so it's really important to take advantage of the sea we have. Absolutely, and just also addressing the point that Ambassador Kim made about the youth. When we uh, invite staff in, uh, we always ask them, why did you choose our company? Why do, you, why do you want to work for us? You could have chosen any Korean conglomerate or go to government. And usually it's the same story we hear all over again. I want to be part of the solution. I want to be part of leaving the world just a little bit better than what I got from my folks. And therefore, I choose a company that's heavily invested in mm. the green energy transition. We, as I said before, have been a utility for a long, long time. So we've been part of the problem. Our board and our uh, group CEO have taken a very committed stance to say we want to be part of the solution and have a just transition. And therefore, we've made our own pledges to become net zero by 2040. And that's something that resonates uh, with, with, uh, with the younger generations, for sure. Indeed. And Ambassador Kim, um, like Mr. Orfeld just mentioned, South Korea is a promising market for co companies that are working to develop renewable energy sources. How is the South Korean government working to create a better environment for companies that are developing renewable energies? Um, first of all, uh, Korea has, as I already mentioned, Korea has a very clear uh, target to achieve net zero by 2050 and 40% reduction of uh, greenhouse, gas emission, greenhouse gases emission by 2030. So under that target, Korea also has a targets how much uh, Korea is going to increase renewable energy, uh, how much greenhouse gas emission uh, Korea is going to reduce in industry sector, in transportation sector, and in agriculture sector, so and so forth. Therefore, first of all, I'd like to emphasize that clear target and clear message uh, from the top to achieve greenhouse gas emission reduction. I, I think that's the most important element to encourage companies uh, to, to, to invest in uh, green sector. Uh, and secondly, Korean government, uh, in collaboration with commercial banks, uh, is providing many incentives, financial incentives program to companies. It means companies, if they have a plan to invest in renewable energy or in green sector, uh, they, can, they can get a loan from the bank, uh, they can make unnecessary finance, they can mobilize finance for their new business uh, development. Uh, in addition to that, Korean government is providing um, so-called carbon 
trading emission trading system, which is also uh, an incentive and also a, a reason for business people, business uh, sector to reduce the greenhouse gas emission. So not only the the efforts from the government, I believe actually Korean companies they are doing a lot of they are they, they are taking a lot of actions from their side, because most Korean companies they are exporting to other countries. 70% of Korea's GDP is coming from export. It means uh, Korean companies, they must meet the need from the outside to reduce greenhouse gas emission and to produce more climate-friendly climate, uh, climate friendly products. So business, uh, the Korean, big Korean companies, most of them, they have uh, net zero targets, they have they have strategies and they are making they are making a lot of efforts and they are taking actions. Um, therefore, uh, I do believe that actually Korea is pretty attractive market for renewable energy expansion and also for green business because Korea itself is a big market and Korea has very high level technology uh, in most important areas, including ICT and uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, so um, I, I do believe that actually more and more uh, foreign investment can come to Korea to increase their, their business and their investment here. Right, um, and Mr. Orfeld, businesses today can benefit from committing to sustainability goals like RWE. Um, do you have any advice or tips would you give to corporate leaders? Maybe one or two tips? I think not investing in the green energy transition is not investing in your own future. And uh, and I think as corporate leaders, we need to understand and appreciate that we have a voice and that uh, those of us who are sat in position of power have a responsibility to do better and to do more. And if I look at our, my own industry and our own company, um, it's, it's, it's really such a joy to see that it's not just engineers. We need engineers, we need lawyers, we need people who know about merit migration, we need people who know about lobbying, we need about permitting. So if you're out there and you're thinking, what should I study in university? My answer when I talk to high school kids is usually, it doesn't matter. Go study anything and you can find a role in the green energy transition. And I think that's really the message, whether you're in currently a position of power or you're looking to make a change, you can start with yourself and you can say, I want my time here to be purposeful and I want to be part of the solution. And I think that's what is not just a message to business leaders, but to all of us to say, we, we have a responsibility. Right, uh, Mr. Orfeld, I'm afraid that's all the time we have for this edition. Thank you so much for your insights today. And Ambassador Kim, thank you so much for your time. Well, that ends Tuesday's edition of Issues and Insiders. Thank you for watching. Do join us again same time tomorrow.